So I'm very proud of you guys for being productive in the meantime. But you worry not. You, you need to be productive no longer. For Scott is coming to save us from ourselves to talk about Mandelbot. So Scott, I mean, uh, I don't. I, maybe this is a slide in your presentation introducing yourself, but maybe not. So just uh, introduce yourself to us. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Scott Bybin, and I'm part of the Mandelbot project. Uh, it was uh, started um, by Lucian Shapar and myself back in about 2014, 20, uh, 2013, and we were building a uh, 3D printer, a portable 3D printer for use in a stage show that I do called Groucho Fractal, which is a bike-powered stage show where audience members use brain-computer interface to make 3D printed organic vegan snacks. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, so cool. yeah, so it's a, it's an ecotech science mutant technology stage show. Can somebody get a picture of me with this genius for the, for the vegan snacks? You're the genius, genius. Oh, hey. <laughs> Yo, you stop. Get off my stage. All right, we are up and ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this on. Let's give Scott a hand as he talks with us about Mandelbot. Do you have the clicker? Uh, where's the clicker? Clicker. Right here. Oh, excellent. OK. Sorry, I'm so bad with technology. It's hard to figure this stuff out. <laughs> Hi. Um, so uh, here we go. Oh, and graphics aren't even showing up. Ah, whatever. So uh, all kinds of technical problems. We were here at a HackerCon, and we all know that we all have all kinds of crazy technical problems at hacker conferences. Um, so Mandelbot Hab is a continuation of a project that I've been doing for the past several years. It's called Mandelbot. Um, and the idea behind Mandelbot was to have a continuation of the, um, I guess, of the RepRap project, but also thinking about the environmental, uh, social, psychological, and political impact of technology while actually creating these things. And uh, let's go to another slide. Oop. Here we go. So. One of the main philosophies behind Mandelbot is that um, when designing these technologies, it's really important to use scientific approaches to figure out what works. It's also really important to add a bit of artistry and a bunch of, like a little bit of weirdness and magic and just kind of guesswork um, and uh, creativity, of course. And as I mentioned before, when, uh, when we're putting these technologies out into the world, one of the things that might be good um, is to actually think about like, well, what, what actually happens? Like once we actually make this prototype, once we do this thing, if it's actually going to get out into the world, like how do we make sure that it's not going to destroy the planet? How is it not going to destroy the ecosystem? How is it going to impact things like, like people's work patterns or jobs or mental health or all other types of things like that. It shouldn't necessarily stop us from developing the technologies, but these are things I think that I would like to see people get in the practice of thinking about when actually making these types of things. Let's see. Whoop. Okay. So some of the inspiration behind the project comes from uh, old projects, new projects, um, here you'll see, uh, let's see this, um, there's this one image right over here of, oops, right over here where the mouse is. This is Arcosanti, which is in Arizona. It's a project that was by Paolo Soleri um, and a bunch of other people who helped uh, him out. And uh, this photo is by Masha Mitkova, who's here in the audience somewhere. Hello, Masha. Thank you so much for taking the photo. Um, Masha just went around over the past, uh, over the past uh, several months traveling to visit all kinds of ecotecture projects, uh, natural building and all that other fun stuff. So she might have something to say afterwards. Um, here's a, another project. There's another part of the um, uh, Arcosanti project. This right over here is from the Venus project. This over here is an Earth ship. And this over here is Buckminster Fuller. So 
in uh, let's see, here we go. In um, in creating those those projects, one of the things that they were thinking about is um, systems design and changes in patterns of consumption. So if we go back to the slide over here of the Earth ship, which you can see on the upper right, that building is actually made from old tires and earth and cement, and bottles, uh, old, other types of things that are being reused in a smart way such that they don't, uh, that in the desert of New Mexico where a lot of these originate, um, they, um, they don't need air conditioning, the, it's like you know, passive solar heating, uh, good ventilation, you know, just a really, really cool step, but just using the detritus of our, you know, kind of industrial age. Let me zoom over here. Um, and in, uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, what Buckminster Fuller uh, was thinking about is like how to create, um, how to create the largest uh, impact, like efficiency-based impact using the least amount of resources. So if you look over here, uh, at the Fuller Dome, you can see that it's a bunch of lengths of pipe that are connected. Uh, and uh, in this per particular way, like all, you know, using triangles, uh, as a way of, I guess, having a very, I guess, having really good strength in the structure and adding a lot of surface area. Uh, Using uh, using very few uh, materials, and here let's zoom over here. Okay, so let's see my background. Okay, so um, so we started this uh, Mel this Mandelbot project a long time ago. Sorry, uh, like a few years ago. Here we go with Lucian and I. It originally started as a um, as a thing to use in the Groucho Fractal Show, which is a kind of ecotech uh, stage show that I've been doing for a while where I go around and teach people about science. And it's like educational. Uh, <clears throat> it also, uh, I guess, involves a bit of, you know, kind of activist thinking, like, you know, how do we, how do we make effective social change? How do we make effect effective environmental change and have fun while doing it? And so um, Lucian and I kind of created this project together called Super Hyper Innovative Technologies, with a very fun acronym. And we did this uh, thinking it might be really funny to get into the Maker Fair with uh, that particular acronym. And so several years ago, we actually did manage to get this sh shady acronym over here into the Maker Fair. Um, <clears throat> and over here, what you're looking at is uh, the third version of the Mandelbot Portable, which is a folding 3D printer that could be assembled in a few minutes. It's less than 100 parts. Most of it is 3D printed. And the print head that you're looking at is the goo extruder because it extrudes goo. And uh, it's, um, well, how could I describe it? Basically, it prints, with, it prints with almond paste. Well, I mean, I guess technically it's not just almond paste. There's also a little bit of apricot and salt in there for taste. Um, yeah, so, uh, and there's a joke in here as well. Um, so, Mandelbrot is a tribute to Mandelbrot, Benoit Mandelbrot, the mathematician who described the Mandelbrot set of fractals, um, which are fractals that are naturally occurring in, uh, in nature. And uh, Mandel in German, of course, as we know, is almond, yes. So, we're basically making almond cookies on the Mandelbot printer. Sorry, it's a really bad joke. Anyway. So here we go. This is the project, the newest thing. This is the Mandelbot Hab. Uh, so Jake Clark and I uh, got together a couple of years ago. Uh, and there are like several other people who are involved in the project that I need to give a shout out to as well. Um, who are these people? Yeah. So um, the people who worked on this were Lucian Chapar, Adolf Alexander, uh, Nick Rubin, Nathan Windsor, Esteban Reichberg, uh, Tyler Smoothie Randall. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see who else. Liz Cole and a few, yeah, and uh, Mark Dussier and Urs Gaudens. 
Um, so we basically put our heads together and thought, like, how do we actually create a cheap, easy to transport, lightweight, um, easy to assemble 3D printer for printing with natural materials? So this is what we came up with. Basically, we're using staging truss. We just finally finished the, uh, the CAD models, and we're about 20% of the way done on the prototype. This whole model is roughly, like the build area is roughly uh, like five meters by five meters by five meters. And so it's like pretty, pretty large. And uh, here, let's see, what you're looking at is the beginning of a structure. Maybe we could use this as like a, a stage for a DJ to play on or whatnot. So, you know, if we have this at a festival and, you know, people can play music and then we can project onto the surface of the, of the printer uh, while people are playing, which could be fun. Uh, but anyway, like you can make houses over here, or you can make uh, columns, any other types of things. This is the uh, print head, so we don't actually have the print head that we've been working on in there. That's kind of coming up in the future. Um, but essentially, it's just a hopper like a kind of a funnel with an auger on top, with an auger in it, and a motor on top. So you basically just put a combination of clay, sand, and biomaterials in there. So you could use any kind of biomaterials like grass or uh, you know, um, wasp, which is a project that inspires us a lot in northern Italy. They use rice hulls, and they've done that in their, in their project uh, that they do called Gaia. Um, where what they did was they took a, they took a, the clay from the ground on, on the site of their factory. They dug it up, mixed it with sand, mixed it with rice hulls, and then they printed, uh, they printed a circular structure with it with corrugated walls. And that was, that was one of the primary uh, inspirations behind, like, behind uh, us actually deciding to get this done. So let's see. As I mentioned, it was it's uh, it's cheap um, in price. Let's see if I can get. Sorry, we had a bit of technical difficulty a little bit earlier. Okay, so um, one of the things about this also is that uh, the design for it was scalable because we have this idea that what if like rather than just having an object, you just make this printer and put it out into the world. What if people could make a custom-sized 3D printer? So we put our heads together and thought, like, okay, like these come in pretty standard lengths. What if we could just stretch it out and just have people rent the parts wherever they are? Like, let's say they have our connector pieces, and then they just rent the parts from a from a staging supply place, and then they have them as long as they need them, and then they bring them back, and all they have are kind of our connector pieces, like the, the motors, the, uh, the bearings, all the, different <clears throat> all the different things, the microcontroller, so they don't have to carry all this stuff around with them. But then they can just rent it. So what it does is it, it decreases the ecological footprint of transportation because these things are actually like readily found. And rather than people having to actually buy the staging, they can, you know, they can rent it or... Uh, Let's see, so anyway, it's, the idea behind it is to have it scalable. So let's say someone wants to increase the, the X dimension, the Y dimension, the height, whatever it is, um, they can do that. And uh, one of the things that I've been very um, involved with over, I guess, you know, later part, of, I guess, yeah, most of my adult life, is I've been involved in collectives. Uh, so in 2002, Liz Cole and I started a collective called the Evil Twin Booking Agency, and we organized tours for public speakers, like a lot of artists, activists, mad scientists, and different, different people. And our decision-making process is thoroughly horizontal. Like, we don't have bosses in the organization. We have, like, several people who are working with us. And we have a consensus process. We have a kind of process that allows us to get things done kind of uh, easily as we need, you know, as we need, need to. So it's like sometimes like pure consensus, it's sometimes, you know, we trust each other to kind of get things done. 
And while having a lot of practice doing this over time, you know, I thought about like, how do we actually like share these ideas in these, you know, these things that we've learned over time? And the one thing that I came up with after being involved in the kind of crypto scene for a while is like, well, why don't we express these agreements that we have and these consensus processes in a smart contract? So the idea is that you, in a program, you scale the printer uh, to the dimensions that you want. Then you combine the blue, you have the blueprint from it, the microcontroller programming. You combine that with the governance agreements that you have. Like let's say you have, um, let's say you have ownership types of uh, agreements. Like the, let's say five people own it. And you can express that in the contract, like whether you, you know, have them as uh, just a, identified by a public key or you have them identified by name, whatever it is that you guys ag agree to in what, whatever configuration. And then you store that on a public uh, immutable distributed ledger. I don't necessarily want to use the, the B word, even though we, we all love the B word sometimes for blockchain. Um, but uh, um, but there are many different types of distributed ledgers that um, you know that we can use for this. Uh, so after it winds up being expressed as a smart contract, you can trade it. You can you can sell. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, but it's just a I guess a good way of uh, it's a I, I think it's a good experiment in terms of expressing horizontal like horizontal govern governance. It, because um, sometimes it's it's difficult to kind of uh, have agreement with th or to remember agreements that you make with with people, and uh, and it's good to be able to refer back to that and not have to ref not have to rely on s centralized storage. Like you know, if you're using some storage from a big company, I think it's preferable to actually store all that stuff via peer to peer, especially if you know if you don't necessarily want people to know what the agreements are within the organization uh, externally. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, so once that's all done, once you have the agreement, it winds up getting uh, expressed as a non-fungible token. So you have this token that represents the object, and that's the thing that you can trade. So let's see, there are a few other a aspects of it that I want to talk about. Um, so we had an idea that uh, rather than selling this as a printer, we're probably going to sell them as kits. And also we want to give people the opportunity to make them their, themselves. So you guys could make your own Mandelbots uh, and put them out into the world, sell them. Uh, we're probably going to be uh, registering it as uh, cc-by-sa um, so that you just have to give us attribution. You can, you can kick something down if you want to, you don't have to. And we're also planning on having a similar kind of marketplace like Open Bazaar, where you'll be able to offer to build a Mandelbot for somebody or maybe 3D print a house. Um, you can offer your services or you could request services. And uh, uh, let's see. And then uh, we plan to take it out to festivals, eco villages, um, hacker camps and other types of places where we hope to build a community. So right now, uh, what we have is this, we have the CAD model pretty much finished, and we have a prototype, as I mentioned, which is about 20% done. We're hoping to have it operational by about February or March of 2020, and then bringing it out into the world and sharing it. Um, and if uh, you're interested in plugging into the project, like whether it's, um, whether it's you know in doing CAD modeling, whether it's in um, designing smart contracts for something like this, if you want to learn about uh, horizontalism, and uh, what else do we need? Um, yeah, and the the last thing that I wanted to mention is that we're hoping to build a kind of a community, a kind of like uh, open material science community, where we can examine the different types of materials that can be used, like the different blends of sands and clays and, you know, and, and biomaterials that can be mixed together in order to be printable. Because so many of the blends that 
are being put together for 3D building printing right now are proprietary. And it's going to slow down the entire process of actually getting this stuff out into the world. Cement accounts for about 10% of the greenhouse gases that are produced. Because one of the one of the main ingredients for cement is lime. And the way you produce lime is that you take limestone, you put it in a kiln, and when it breaks down, it releases carbon dioxide gas, and a lot of it. And it also takes a lot of fuel in order to break down in order to break down the uh, break down the limestone. So um, so you have this this impact and it's it's just one way of making a binder for cementitious materials. We can do other things, like there, um, you can use basalt, you can use ash, and other types of things. So the idea behind the material science lab, this kind of decentralized and distributed material science lab, is to research the different blends that we can, that we can make and then open source those things so that we can share the knowledge all across the world and hopefully print things out with Mandelbots and things that are inspired by Mandelbot that kind of bring it to, you know, further levels. So that is, uh, I guess that's our offering uh, to you guys. And here we go. This is another, uh, another view of it. So uh, again, it's uh, inspired by the RepRap project. Uh, it's made with staging truss, easy to assemble, easy to transport, low power consumption. Um, we're also uh, creating a microgrid for it. Uh, uh, there was a really inspiring project that shot 2017 that we saw, which was alt power, and they did the microgrid there, a 42 volt mi DC microgrid. It was super impressive. So we're thinking about utilizing that in order to power the, um, in order to power the, the printers. And it's also scalable. Here we go. And this is my contact information. Yeah. So I um, wanted to thank you guys. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Gregor. Hi. Sorry, squeaking. So okay. uh, thank you for the great presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think it's an awesome project. And I have a little bit of provocative question. Oh, speak, speak closer to the I, mic. I have a little bit of a provocative question. Okay. Do you envision Mandelbots becoming autonomous sometime in the future? And what would that mean? Well, so um, do I envision them becoming autonomous? Well, Jake and I were kind of joking around about actually giving uh, Teo Janssen style legs to the... Um, to the Mandelbots so that they can kind of walk around and plop themselves wherever wherever they want to go. So that might be a fun thing. So if there are any machine learning geeks here who want to create autonomous um, Mandelbots, it would be really, really funny to have a kind of, rather than a critical mass bike ride, have a whole bunch of the Mandelbots taking over the streets. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, uh, speak right uh, into Okay, yeah. yeah. If I understood correctly, the bot will like print the house as it would print like a plastic toy, for instance. But uh, uh, do you know if uh, there are some tests with using these materials to actually create a house even by hand, like uh, as prototype how this material behaves or what are uh, its thermal properties and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, there are um, there's. There's a lot of research already and a lot of projects that are already doing uh, 3D printed houses. There's WASP, who are one of their huge, huge inspirations. There's another project called ICON. Um, there's AI Space Factory. And they're all, experiment and they're all experimenting with different types of cementitious materials. Um, and what you, so far, um, a lot of the success has been found in printing layer by layer. It's just like typical fused deposition modeling using clay. And, you know, they'll mix other things in it. Uh, you know, they, people are experimenting with, like, putting metal inside of it and, you know, all the other types of things to keep it more structural. 
just recently in, I think it was in Dubai, there was like the world's largest 3D printed uh, building was, was done. And that's, you know, th to me it's like super impressive that they're able to scale and get, you know, get it up, you know, get this stuff in, you know, uh, they're able to m make r like really big structurally sound things. Um, th at ETH Zurich, uh, they've been doing a lot of research as well with, m with materials uh, for 3D printing st uh, structures. So you can, you know, do a search on, on any of this stuff. And if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can show you some photos and some video of stuff others have done that's basically our main inspiration to like really feeling like this is very doable. Yeah. Any other questions before I get off the stage? Yeah. So th thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, and, and a huge, huge thank you to the Critical Decentralization Cluster and to Marcus and Matias and the rest of the team for inviting me and Diego and for being a great host. And uh, yeah, um, and also to Riot, um, if you get a chance, pick up a copy of Future Crypto Economics. It's a great publication. And uh, yeah, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Let's give him one last round of applause. Super interesting stuff. We don't just open source code, guys. We open source concrete, OK? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, that, that's really, really awesome. We're going to take a five minute break. We're going to get set up for our next thing. We're going to try our best to get back on schedule, but I think we're permanently behind forevermore, So which means tomorrow and the next day and the next day will be even further and further and further behind until uh, C3 is going to actually extend for an extra three days. So 